The more movement you do, there's several things that are going to occur. One, your mental state's going to improve. You're, you're going to feel better. It, you create these endorphins that will last like eight hours, the equivalent of an antidepressant. I mean, in fact, it's incredible. Welcome to the Express Soul Health and Wellness Podcast. In each episode, you'll learn from experts about the best practices and technologies to live a happier, healthier, and hopefully a longer life. Here is your host, Claudia Erdinola. Hi, welcome to Express All Health and Wellness Podcast. If this is your first time at my podcast, my name is Claudia Urdinola. I am your host. I am a professional engineer with a passion for health and wellness. I like to invite professionals in the healthcare industry to my podcast to give us perspective and better ways in which you, me, and anyone can take control of their health, of our health, to live longer, happier, and healthier lives. If this is the kind of content that you like to listen, stay with us and please join us by subscribing to our podcast and hitting the notification bell so you will not miss an episode here in our podcast. Also, I would like for you to follow us in all our social media outlets. Today, we have the pleasure to talk to Dr. Laurie Marvas. Dr. Marvas is a double certified family medicine and lifestyle medicine physician who has been utilizing food as medicine since 2012. She is currently holding 50 states medical licenses, including DC, across the United States. She has a concierge practice and is accepting new patients at drmarbas.com. We are posting all of Dr. Marbas' in information, her website, and her contact information in the description box for all of you who, who would like to visit her website and contact her for her services. She is a co-founder of The Healing Kitchen, uh, with Brittany Jerudi, where a chef and a doctor come together in the kitchen to provide a recipe for health. Dr. Marvas is a specialized doctor into the plant-based diet, and here we're going to have uh, part of her experiences uh, on, with her own family and with her patients um, that she has been treating with um, what the plant-based diet. She's going to share with us her insights and experiences in the nutritional benefits of the plant-based diet. As a United States Air Force veteran, she served in the Middle East and in South America. She's also a wife, mom of a three grown children, author, a speaker, and avid runner. In our podcast, we're going to have part one and part two in our conversation with Dr. Marvas. Part one, we are discussing the healthcare delivery system in the United States and getting Dr. Marvas' perspective in what we consider today a very expensive and ineffective healthcare delivery system. We've seen a massive spending of dollars and very little return of the, of the investment as we see that we are ranking so low, about 69 in, in the uh, worldwide ranking into the overall health of the population versus the spending. So it's going to be a very good discussion with Dr. Marvas. You don't want to miss. In part two, we are going to discuss more on the lifestyle medicine that she's a specialist and she's going to share with us, as I said, all of her views and the nutritional value of a plant-based diet. We have uh, a lot of information from her about the blue zones, great practices that anyone can implement to, you know, get a better um, lifestyle and improve the overall health. So two parts, John miss. This is a company amazing. She's very smart and you're going to like what you're going to listen. I let um, my listeners to decide. I think it's good that we have perspectives from, you know, different opinions, different ways of seeing health and wellness. Um, so with no further ado, here it is, 
Dr. Marvas, you mentioned yep. the blue zones, and this yeah. is very, very um, interesting because we, uh, for people that don't know about the blue zones, those are a specific places in the world where we have a density of the population living over a hundred years old in perfect health right. and active and incredibly engaged with community. Perfect health after a hundred. You, you're talking to centenary in one of the blue zones and it's like you're talking to someone in their sixties. They're in perfect health. Right. And we have, uh, you know, different uh, of these blue zones all over the globe not only eating plant-based diets, there are some that eat in some animal uh, meats, and some others only plants, some others drink and smoke. <laughs> and still, they happen to be extremely healthy over, over 100. So other than the diet, it is also other components that are associated with that. What do you think? Um, are, are like the like the common, I would say the, the the common elements between the blue zones that we can take right now and say, okay, if, yeah. if you are in a plant based diet or a whole food diet on the animal based diet, they're still, not going to be animal based common... diet. Yeah. And so let's let's look at the blue zones, the the first five blue zones, okay. right? So if we look at the actual blue zones, that was from Dan Butner, um, who is by himself eats a plant-based diet. So mm -hmm. you have, you have Okinawa, Japan, you have Sardinia, yes. Italy, Loma Linda in California, right? So these are Seventh-day Adventists who are eating a vegetarian Loma Linda. type diet. Yep. Loma Linda, California. You have mm -hmm. Nicoya in Costa Rica and Ikari, Ikaria in Greece, right? So when you think about that, so the, and they're eating like a Mediterranean diet, which is, they may have some fish, but it's plant slant, right? So what are the common Lamb, traits of a chicken? Plant slant. So we look at the common traits of blue zones, right? So one, the diet is pre pre predominantly plant-based with a focus on legumes and beans, whole grains, vegetables, and meat might be eaten That's sparingly, but only mm -hmm. a few times per month, right? So then you look at physical activity. So natural movement is integrated daily, right? Because they're farming, they're walking mm -hmm. in manual labor, they're walking uphill to, to church, um, all these amazing things. You mentioned social engagement, right? So they have strong family ties, community involvement, social networks that is literally built into their culture. Um, stress reduction, right? So they have practices, they, they nap, there's siestas, there's mindfulness, they attend social gatherings and they help each other. You'll see yes. families, um, families and friends, strong sense of purpose is another thing, right? So they, um, really understand they have a purpose for living. Um, and really that contributes, I think, to the overall well-being. So those would be your five common traits. We mentioned, Bruce mentioned that we went to this, uh, trip in, in Southeast Asia. We yeah. saw, doctor, we saw people over 90s cooking and squatting, cooking on yep. the floor, <laughs> standing thing, up huh? and uh, we were in the markets. Amazing. I mean, Amazing. and we asked and extremely happy and she was smoking, cooking again, squatting like nothing it was normal for them and we were like i can't believe this is happening i mean we really uh for living in this comfort let's say we are losing a lot of the mobility flexibility and, yes. and having to get more familiar with heavier bodies instead of or, more agile bodies right, that right. move better um and I, I agree with you. I think right. it's a lack of fiber in our diets is not a good thing. I mean, I, I can see that. I see, the, I, we saw it on our trip. It was right. something Doc that was very obvious. Doctor, right. um, I, I like to think of wellness as like a wheel and there are different yeah. spokes that right. make that wheel function. So I, I'd like to get into that and you, you tell us, give us your formula, give us your protocol or label what those spokes might be, including exercise and, you know, things of that nature. But before we go there, it's one thing, I statistic I'd like to run by. According to a recent study at John Hopkins, 250,000 Americans um, die every year in the United States because of medical mistakes. Uh, it's the yeah. third leading cause of death in this country next to heart disease and cancer. So, right. I mean, it seems to me that we should do everything humanly possible in lifestyle to 
stay out of the hospital. So, you know, sick people are there and mistakes are made. So, again, not being overly critical of hospitals. They do good, obviously. But, I mean, third leading cause of death, a comment on that. And then if we could focus the conversation more toward your your prescription, your your protocols, filling in the different spokes that complete that wheel of wellness. We'd appreciate that. Yeah, so I I think it's a really important thing to highlight that a system that promotes sick care and is going to make mistakes, right? Because um, sick people are fragile. And so it's going to be easier to make medical mistakes and, and ultimately harm someone and potentially kill someone. So there's even more, you know, versus the mortality, what's the morbidity, right, of polypharmacy and taking, you know, it's not uncommon to see patients come in with 10 or 12 medications. And these are some serious medications Mm -hmm. and they wonder why they don't feel well, why they're fatigued. So now you're dealing not only with a sick person in front of you, you have limited time capacity, but you're also thinking, man, not only are the side effects of these medications an issue, but the interactions of these medications are an issue. So now you have to become a pharmacist specialist, but luckily with the advent of technology, you can work on that. But yes, um, our system is broken in many, many ways. And at the end of the day, the one that's suffering the most is the patient. Um, they don't have any autonomy. They're at the whims and mercies of whoever they get to see. Many times they don't even get to see the same primary the same care doctor. provider or uh-huh. provider. And it's unfortunate. So until we do understand that we need to be one advocates of our own health and we walk into a system fairly well educated and can converse with someone who will speak to us in lay language that they understand it can make informed decisions because I think anybody that doesn't give you the breadth and depth of whatever your choices are to address, let's say hypertension or diabetes. Now medications, absolutely. I use medications on a daily basis with patients, but at a minimal with the goal mm-hmm. is to become free of medications or the least amount of medications. And so that's, that needs to be the conversation. So until we are actually saying, Let's look at your lifestyle. How are you moving? How are you walking? How are you sleeping? How is your stress? And give people time to do that or at least provide someone in their team that I can like, okay, next stop is the health coach or next stop is this registered dietitian. Next stop is the psychologist. You know, if we don't think about how we can help support each other and work as a team to help these patients and pay for it instead of, you know, the reactive something like we need to step back and say, we need to pay for the prevention of the progression of this disease. We're not going to get anywhere. So of course, mistakes are going to happen because someone's over prescribed something or uh, some interventions done that didn't need to be done. And then someone gets a subsequent infection or something like that, or some complication that's going to happen. I mean, that's just the, you roll the dice and you build the system we have. That's just, that's just the way it is. Um, so we accept that. I mean, the first step is you just have to accept it. This is the state of affairs. And what's the steps? Well, I mean, that's kind of the second question you asked is, well, what do I do? What have I seen? Well, I stepped out of the quagmire that I was in. Um, you know, I worked within the system the best I could. And then I was like, man, this is not working. I'm, I made some progress, but I can't change this Titanic. And so what I need to do is be the tugboat, jump off, <laughs> jump on the tugboat and go do my thing. And has it been easy? No, but it's certainly been worth it. Um, and so with that piece, what do I do? Right. So I still practice family medicine, right? I don't see patients in person because I want to see patients who are ready to make change, um, Mm -hmm. across the country. So I have seen a patient in every state of this country. And, um, I can say the one common trait that everyone here, they're, they're tired of suffering, right? And so that really needs to be the step one is that, they understand that they're they're sick of suffering. They understand they can make different choices, right? They're they're done being like, I'm just tired of being the victim of this crazy system. What can I do? And so they reach out to someone who can help guide them to understand what are those things I can start implementing in my life to really see a shift in their health. And there are going to be some common, simple things people can do. Like you mentioned, number one, eat more fiber, eat more plants. And if you don't want to give up animal products, that's fine. Just start eating more plants, throw in Mm -hmm. some more veggies, throw in, do a smoothie, eat some more fruit, Fruit. you know, do something, just anything. Beans are the one food associated Mm -hmm. across all the blue zones with longevity. Add a cup of beans to your diet. Oh my heavens, great source of protein, great source of fiber, 
good for your digestion, great for your microbiome. <laughs> Just start there. Number two is that's okay. Number, I think number two is, well, there's, there's five things that are really important, but number two would be, let's focus in on movement. What is the movement? Because even if you get poor sleep, exercise has been shown to be beneficial to even, um, counteract a, a poor sleep. So the more movement you do, there's several things that are going to occur. When your mental state's going to improve, you're, you're going to feel better. It, you create these endorphins that will last like eight hours, the equivalent of an antidepressant. I mean, in fact, it's incredible. So just start moving. Do you have to run a marathon tomorrow? No, but you can start with five minutes. I have a great Walking. example of a patient. Right. I said this patient, she was overweight. She was diabetic and just exhausted. I was like, what can we do to start moving every day? She was like, Dr. Morris, I don't have time. I don't feel well. That's the common excuse you're going to hear. I was like, what can you do? And she's like, I don't know. I was like, well, okay, when are you outside and to walk? And she goes, well, when I go to my car to go to work and when I drive home and I park in the driveway, I'm, I'm there. I was like, okay, this is what I need you to do. I need you to walk from your car when you get home to the end of the driveway and back. And she goes, I like, can you do that? And I made it so tiny. She's like, well, of course I can do that. I was like, well, of course. Okay, let's do it. And I made her pinky promise literally within the appointment. I hooked with my pinky. I was like, you promised me you're going to do this. She goes, yeah. I was like, I'm serious. She's like, okay. And so before you know it, she's like, she's walking to the end of the driveway and back. She's like, this is crazy. I can walk around the block. Well, she walks around the block, then two and three. And then she's walking two or three miles a day. She's shifting to a plant-based diet. She's losing 60 pounds and reversing her diabetes. That is a common story. And so this, these are the type of things that happen when you start doing tiny things. They build momentum. You build confidence. You change the rhetoric in your mind from saying, I can't, I'm not worthy. I can and I, and I will. And so that's the piece there. So now we've got more fiber, better movement which all moves to better sleep because you're in less pain, you're losing weight, you're you're seeing a ton of improvement in sleep. So now we're sleeping you know, seven to nine hours, trying to get to bed before 11, try to get that 11 to four, really important, getting good um, morning sunshine in those eyeballs to tell the brain, okay, I'm starting my circadian rhythm and in about 16 hours, I'm gonna be ready for bed. There's so many things you can do with your sleep hygiene you know, keeping the room dark, dark and cool. Don't eat three hours before bed. You know, again, so many things you can be going on there. Next is stress management. So let's talk about stress. My key thing with stress is mindfulness practices, because once I start the mindfulness muscle, it, it explodes into everything else. And really understanding that people have different choices, even in how they react to responses, right? So your life circumstances may not be ideal, but once you accept that's what they are and you decide, okay, I'm going to just be mindful of this. What can I do when, when I, I'm calm and not reacting to a situation? Stress drops dramatically. And, you know, finally it's social connection, right? So what can you do to be with someone, you know, that you care and love for and really be present, not just, oh, I'm with my kids, but I'm watching television or I'm scrolling, you know, my phone, you know, mothers, young mothers that are breastfeeding are on their phone and they're missing that context. And now we're seeing some things happen where that baby is not connecting with the mother. Mm -hmm. And so again, that's just one small example. Set aside time where, you know, technology is turned off and that you're really engaging with someone. And then when you're listening don't be thinking about what's the next thing I can say in this conversation. Instead, take a deep breath, yep. connect to the moment, and really just cherish that moment with them. And understand that's a sacred interaction with another human being. When you start viewing things like that, boy, it's a game changer. That is the very quick synopsis of what I would recommend for patients. But it goes much more into depth. But yeah, but that yep. is where I found life can really just shift for so many people, regardless of their, their current circumstances. So, Doc, I just want to uh, let the audience know that all of your information along with your website, you have a challenge for uh, losing weight that yeah. is there on your website as well. All of that information, we're going to put in the description box of our podcast. And, hey, we want, we want to give perspective to our audience. And, again, I mean, in, in our podcast, we had doctors that had been advocating the keto diets, uh, we got Dr. Eric Weisman, and he is a, a professor, doctor professor at Duke University Medical School, Dr. Ken Berry. 
And when I asked them, what, what is the way to get healthy? They say there are many ways to get healthy in their experience in implementing in diets that include animal products would be in your experience. And, and it is on the plant-based diet. I, I just, it, it could be a little bit confusing from, from us that are like the, you know, like, like the regular people. We're, we're not the doctors. Um, how we can offer that perspective of wellness to our Good. audience and reconciling um, the difference, uh, a concept the of wellness. Yes, sure. I think so. People are going to always look to hear, you know, look for science or for things to support the uh, healthy ha or habits that they're already in, in doing. Right. So I grew up uh, in eastern New Mexico. I ate a, a regular diet, but we didn't have a lot of money. I came from a home. Like my mother was a teenage pregnancy. I, we grew up, my, we did not have the money to go out to eat. We didn't have, uh, we grew our own food and our vegetables. So I already ate tons of beans because they were cheap. I ate a lot of potatoes. Mm -hmm. We had some meat and we certainly had some dairy, but I was very fortunate that the processed food wasn't in the home because it was more expensive. And I was like, listen, you're eating what we got. We're cooking your hot breakfast. You're going to, and we were in the kitchen cooking and that's just the way it was. And it was so I mean, to my benefit. Exactly. So the poor American rural growing up was amazing. Um, so I just carried that forward in my own life with my own kids. So, you know, but my husband came from a different background. So he was, family was Navy. They were Filipino. Uh, he was born in really? the U.S., but um, they would go and eat, you know, get a ton of processed foods from the commissary, chow down. So he had already developed different eating habits. But so that's when we went on a plant-based diet, you know, even all of that went away. That's when we saw that rapid weight loss for my husband. And it was a real interesting clue because... The reason I went to a plant-based diet, and I can share this story, was mm -hmm. number one, I was in Wifel, Colorado. It's a town of about 12,000 people in 2012. So this is early 2012. And a patient came in. She's like, Dr. Marvis, meat and dairy upset my stomach. I said, well, stop eating meat and dairy. <laughs> Understanding that mm -hmm. there were foods that she can consume, but I didn't think, oh, that's a plant-based diet because I hadn't heard that concept yet. And she came back in 30 days. What happened in that 30 days is her daughter, who was 16 at the time, wanted to help her mother with the dietary change that she had. Now, we lived in a small town in 2012. There wasn't these plant-based junk food, right? This ultra-processed foods. There um, there were no restaurants mm -hmm. that would be offering it. So they cooked at home, number one. They're eating mm -hmm. whole foods, number Good. two. And what happened was really interesting. <clears throat> she brought her daughter to the appointment, made her miss school to come to this appointment. And she goes, now you tell Dr. Marvis what you did. And I'm thinking as a doctor and a mom at this point, I'm like, huh? Cause I had three teenagers at that time. And she's like, so tell me, uh, she goes, tell Dr. Marvis what you, she goes, well, I wanted to help my mom, you know, feel better and cook. And so I was helping in the kitchen. And so I started eating these foods. I felt so good. Dr. Marvis, I stopped both my attention deficit disorder medications, two ADD meds. I was like, what? She goes, yeah. Mom was like, why was she able to do that? Mom wasn't angry, but she was really frustrated because she's like, if I could have just told my daughter to eat a certain way and she not require medications, it could potential serious side effects. Why hasn't anyone told me that? I was like, I don't know, but that's the coolest thing I've ever heard. So I started asking like, what were you eating? She goes, what you said. It was fruits and vegetables. It was mm -hmm. beans, legumes. It was whole grains, nuts and seeds because that's what was left. I was like, Oh my heavens. So I went out and I Googled plant-based diet and ADD. And the first book that came up was the China study. I read that book. It's 400 pages of an epidemiologic study in China. Amazing. I'm reading this book and my husband's like, he'd walk by and I was like, they're turning off cancer with plants. I'm like, what are you, but he's like, what are you talking about? It's like, it's exciting. So I was like, whoa. So I, that's when I fully understood the power of what's on your plate. And so as I'm trying to figure out this in my brain, I was about a week or so, two weeks later, I had a patient with lupus. Lupus is an autoimmune disease, mm -hmm. has to be terminal, very, very I have serious. an aunt who died by lupus. A hundred percent. And this patient was younger mm -hmm. than me. She was diagnosed two years earlier. She was on 12 medications, 50 pounds overweight. Mm -hmm. She was on things such as methotrexate, high doses of prednisone, 
And she was miserable. She came to, she's like, Dr. Morris, I don't think I can keep working. I'm in so much pain. I'm so sick. And I was like, you know, I don't think there's another medication that we can provide you or another specialist for you to see. I said, I think we need to change what's on the end of your fork. I told her about what we, what I was learning. She went on a whole food plant-based diet. I said, before you leave though, we're going to measure your markers of inflammation. That's CRP was three times high normal. She came back in two weeks. She had dropped eight pounds. Her headaches and migraines she had had for most days of the week were gone. And her CRP dropped 300% just outside normal. And I was like, that's it. I'm going home and we're changing to plant-based diet. But I'll tell that patient five months later, 50 pounds lighter, off seven of 12 medications, including the steroids, including the methotrexate, the immune suppressant. And her, within two years, her lupus antibodies literally were undetectable for the first time. And so that is key is the inflammation piece, right? That comes with animal products and other things like cholesterol and different things. Again, there's a, there's the science is there. Not the science is there a bit over there for well over a, a century showing the benefits of a primarily plant-based diet. So anyway, I went home overnight. We went plant-based. It's been 12 years and there's a fun story that goes with that. But the, the key here to understand is there's so many benefits, not only to the individual, but also to one, the system, the climate uh, resources that are required to sustain a completely animal-based diet is going to disrupt our environment and promote climate change. And, and three, the, the cost is, is tremendously much more to support that. And, um, you know, at the, at the end of the day, as you start walking this plant-based path, I really became to understand the animal agricultural, <laughs> the, the factory farming is cruel. And if you love animals, you're going to be hard pressed to continue to eat that when you see the realities of the system that we've built, that one is creating foods that really make people sick. So I can go on and on about patients who converted from a, a standard American diet or from a keto no. diet that have tremendous uh, improvements and in their I health. And I can see that, um, you know, doctor, th those of your patients, and you probably have hundreds, I mean, over the years since you changed your your diet and teach others how to get healthy, probably you have a lot of those the same. Yes. We got um, people, uh, influencers like Dr. Jordan Peterson. He's very popular. His right. uh, daughter, Michaela, who uh -huh. healed herself by, you know, eliminating all that she discovered that she was very sensitive to certain foods and eliminating those and going to what she calls lion diet. Uh -huh. She got uh, totally healed from the, you know, all of those uh, autoimmune diseases that she has. So I can see that uh, there are benefits of eliminating a lot of foods. And I, what I see is my question to you, do you think it's possible that because we're not the same one to another human. There are some humans that thrive, really, really thrive on a plant-based diet, and some others that maybe thrive eating some animal foods. Do you think, or or what would be like, or is a rule that applies to all? I think if you look at us anatomically, right? So if you look at the physiologic nature of how we're built, right? With our, from the mouth through the intestines, mm -hmm. we are built to eat plants, number one, right? So that's just the reality of the situation. What's very interesting about humans is that we have the ability to adapt to many, many environments, right? And so we can live in a place where we only have access to animal products and still live. Now, will we live and thrive as well as we could maybe someone who lives in subtropics and eating a very diverse plant-based diet primarily? Probably not, right? So there's absolutely case studies of that. So when you think about, it really depends on mm -hmm. what you want as far as your metric of wellness and well-being. Got um, it. You certainly can live a life and contain animal products. Do you have to? Absolutely not. And I think you know, when you look at individual cases and you say, well, this person, they did this. I was like, it's very nuanced, especially when it comes to autoimmune disease, right? So there's going to be food sensitivities and it, the, the way to intervene with a plant-based diet would be very, very um, specialized to that person, but mm -hmm. it absolutely can be done. And I've seen it done with someone with lupus, with severe uh, inflammatory bowel disease, things like that. Um, mm -hmm. Now the, the key here, the key factor is here is 
It's also the individual health, but it's also the environmental health. And you cannot disregard the ecological impact of eating animal products. We and just the quality of the food. It. Dog. Right, right. We, we can't sustain it. We're cutting down rainforests to grow places for more cattle to grow. This is a one and done input, right? So you raise one cow, it's not regenerative. It's dead and you eat it and then it's on to the next one. And so you need more and more resources, water, land, all those things. And so you can't deny that. People can try, but the reality is that's the way it is. And so it makes but people ill. So yeah. Our Expresso Health and Wellness Podcast is sponsored by Expresso Coffee. Expresso Coffee is our brand of coffee that we created with your health in mind. And as you know, you probably see this all over uh, social media. We launched recently our Be The One Coffee, which is the coffee that is an initiative that we are doing with the American Legion to support Be The One program to help end veteran suicide. So every time you purchase Be The One Coffee, you are part of the solution. You are helping to prevent veteran suicide. So just go www.expressolcoffee.com. You can use code LEGION for a 15% off of your order. And I want to thank you. Thank all of you who already purchased Be The One Coffee because you are helping veterans in need. You are being part of the solution. For all of you that still don't know how delicious, how amazing is our coffee, and you want to be part of the solution, go to www.expressolcoffee.com, enter code LEGION for 15% off your purchase. And remember, shipping is free on all orders over $50. Thank you for your support. Doug, but I, when I say the quality of the food, when, when sure. we're talking about whole foods here, yeah. basically as a base of wellness, I mean, I, I, I will see, and again, I was vegetarian for nine years. I, I've okay. been on that side. It was very good to me because I was very close to good sources of plant-based food. I'm an engineer and... I was moved to a place where I did not have the same access to all of the nutrients that I needed to support myself. So I had to go and eat uh, meats. And since then, I, I've been eating both. I, we eat both here at home. We consume a, a lot of um, fermented foods. We love fruits and, and berries. We eat blueberries like crazy here, organic wild yeah. blueberries we love it so we know the benefits of of, of those uh, foods as well um but what i see is um we live in a very toxic world and even sure. on, on the plant-based diet it, it, it would be very good but if if you don't need a if you don't consume your source of food being organic you're eating in plant-based food your know, diet but you're consuming a lot of pollutants you know chemicals and and uh, so you have to be careful in whatever you eat on having a you know clean sources of food so 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 doctor mass produce uh, food in both sides i don't think is good we could we could go Processed on and on foods, for hours for sure. on yeah. hours on this and it's great information <laughs> uh doctor so you're i i'd heard you say you don't see patients face to face all of your practice is done telemedicine. through tele telehealth. Yeah, amazing. Amazing how technology has supported that. People yeah. get the help they need from you. That's great. Are are you at capacity? Or are you still taking on patients? I'm still seeing patients, yeah, absolutely. Good. Um, Good. Certainly, you know, and there's many, many other doctors like myself who are available locally if someone prefers to see someone in person as well. And they can go to the American College of Lifestyle Medicine and mm -hmm. search for a provider. There's um, amazing, amazing uh, practitioners across the country. Yeah. Does your daughter work with you? My daughter is finishing her residency in Boston okay. at Tufts. And so she'll be okay. done in June. And uh, she's uh, going to continue working in the Boston area. But I am trying to get her out here to we'll see. I, it's, it's a joy to go up and see her, though. Awesome. That's great. We we started from the big macro and the healthcare delivery system and all the things that's wrong with that and how we need to turn it upside down and focus on wellness rather than sickness. That's a huge right. challenge. But as individuals, right. 
you know, following a protocol like you're, um, like you're describing, you know, we can do that, that we are empowered mm-hmm. to do that. One, one question, and I, I think we should, are probably coming to the end of our time, but, you know, I, I said I'm 75 years old. And, you know, a lot of people, because I'm still active, I can go play basketball with my son. We play golf. I pump iron every day. And oh, uh, people say, oh, you got good genes. No, I don't. <laughs> my father died at 50 years old, 50 years old. Yep. He, he drank too much. He smoked cigars. He was overweight. He's a World War II veteran, and he was fighting a lot of demons. My yeah. brother died at 55 with colon uh, cancer. He, uh, he led a poor lifestyle. So give me, give us your take on genetics versus lifestyle. Sure, sure. When you look at the actual research, um, genetics is about 2% of the actual total picture, right? So it certainly can predispose someone. So I always like to tell people genetics will load the gun, the proverbial gun, but your lifestyle will pull the trigger, right? So when we look at genes, you, you're, there's actually things that are occurring even before you're born, right? So if you think about it, my grandmother who carried my mother, my mother formed her eggs, which is half of me during in utero with my grandma. So what my grandmother ate and did and dealt with affected Mm -hmm. my mother's health, which then affected. So then when my mother was carrying me, that affected my daughter and my son's health, my two boys, you know, those things happen. So there's some epigenetics that can serve. So you'll see that genetic Mm -hmm. trait. So that's why we're seeing potentially people getting sicker younger, plus we're living in a sicker system Mm -hmm. and all that. But so there's some epigenetic components, but they can be turned off, right? So when you look at studies that include um, identical twins, you intervene with one, even though they're identical genetically, mm-hmm. one will uh, be exposed to unhealthy diets, unhealthy lifestyle, whatever, will develop illness when the other one won't. And we're dealing with the same genetic model here. And you're exactly right. Don't If someone says, oh, I'm just going to get diabetes because my mom and dad had it. Well, that mindset, that belief leads to behaviors that, well, guess what? You're going to manifest that illness for yourself. Right. Just like my real biological father had his first heart attack at 38. My granddad died at 46. My mother and her mother and all their sisters have had breast cancer. Do I think I'm going to get those? No. Now, does it mean I don't have a propensity for it or a, a higher risk? Of course. But it doesn't mean that I'm going to believe that or I'm certainly not going to be doing or making choices that make it more likely to happen. But at the end of the day, it does. For human, we're going to die. It's just the way it is. But I know that at the end of the day, I have a choice and my choices will have a huge impact on my quality of life. That's the other thing. So you can have extension of your life. And for the first, well, I think the last two or three years in the United States, our life expectancy has started it's to regress. Yes. Right. And so, you know, my children's, their generation is projected to live <laughs> a shorter lifespan than their parents. And they are also at higher risk for colon and rectal cancer. They, mm-hmm. and if you're between ages 18 and 35, they have the highest risk factors. What in the world? And so I thought that started is, in your 40s before you were start ha- uh, supposed to have the yeah. uh, colonoscopies. Yeah. So those are getting younger and younger, right? They're making mm-hmm. those recommendations wow. to be decreased. So and sad. it's a really sad situation that we created ourselves. But you also have the choice, like you said, at the end of the day to make a different choice. And... um it's it's really really important. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a big problem. Two last so, questions I have, and then Claudia, yeah. you take over. Go ahead. But <laughs> um, hormone replacement therapy. There. Uh, Claudia is about your age. She's fifty two, and a few years ago, uh, she started going through some, I guess, change of life stuff. Menopause. And, yes. Yeah. Exactly. The menopause. And, <laughs> and, and I. I st- <laughs> I, I started seeing um, my urologist in Miami, and he had another practice. It's called Ultimate Health Miami, where he Good. practices hormone replacement therapy under very scientific conditions. So, yeah. and, and it's been it's been a world of change for me yeah. physically. I'm I'm not talking about steroids. I'm talking about a very controlled environment with supplements that help me stay active, pump iron, run, play basketball, and, and Claudia's symptoms related to her menopause it's been a uh-huh. it's been a game changer for her so oh, one, absolutely. I, I like your 
your opinion on hormone replacement therapy. It's not covered sure. by insurance. Again, that's something that's going to keep you well. They won't pay for something that makes you sick. They'll pay for, uh, and then uh, vitamin supplements as well. Yeah. So, um, yeah, no, I think hormone replacement therapy absolutely has its place and we're very, live in a really interesting time. So if you look at the, when I'm particularly for women, if you look at the, what we call the WHI study, um, it was, published in 2002, where it actually showed that, you know, hormone replacement therapy was not beneficial. It can have dramatic effects on, you know, uh, breast cancer or heart attacks, those mm-hmm. type of things. So there was a huge decline in hormone replacement therapy for many, many years. And um, what's interesting when you start looking at the more recent research and they reevaluated the WHI and how it was actually shared and um, reported incorrectly, they didn't do the nuances of understanding this was an older population. So they were women outside of, you know, more than 10 years mm-hmm. post-menopause um, on oral high doses of estrogen and progesterone. And these were the ones that were having the ill effects. Now, when you look at the other population, women who are, you know, between typically uh, perimenopausal, menopausal age mm-hmm. under usually in their 50s, um, within 10 years of the onset, and they're given maybe more transdermal or topical um, estrogen or progesterone if you still have a uterus, they tend to do very well, right? And it can be absolutely life qual- life-changing for people. Life-changing. Um, and what's interesting, the healthier that you are, if you look at the studies of, for example, women in Japan who consume high amounts of soy products, which have amazing isoflavones, um, that mm-hmm. will actually compete with your need of estrogens. They, you'll see a much less, uh, dramatic symptoms of menopause as they, as they, uh, occur. But anyway, um, absolutely can be employed correctly. Now, what I like to do is I still use scientific education or the edu- the scientific, if you look at this actual research and you go by, for example, the North American Menopause Society, and you're mm-hmm. looking at expert guidance and the research and looking what's the most beneficial. Those are the practice guidelines that I utilize. Um, I don't necessarily agree with bioidentical hormones. These are not um, monitored well. You don't know what the production is. Um, these, you're putting yourself at, I think, higher risk. And that's just my own personal preference and belief. I'd rather use something that has been through the rigors of FDA regulation and understand what I'm actually providing my patient in a very monitored manner. Um, so yes, that absolutely can be very, very helpful. So I'm all for it. If someone needs it, like, absolutely give me more estrogen. Um, and it, like I said, it can be a game changer. The other piece of that, like you mentioned, was the vitamin supplementation. I think we have to look at supplementations as medications, right? So these are going into a system. It's an input. There will be ripple effects. Now there could be quantifiable benefits, but there could also be quantifiable side effects. And if you're giving mega doses, much more than what you would need, um, I think you can be careful uh, or you need to be very careful because you might be actually causing something or more damage than you meant. Sometimes these things are peddled and pushed that are actually don't have any scientific rigor or study behind them. Um, but there are some cases that are absolutely beneficial. For example, um, if you have someone who's eating a plant-based diet, we want them to be on a B12 supplement. And the reason is because B12 is not made by animals and it's not made by plants. It's made by microorganisms and that live in dirt and water. But we live in a really hygienic world. We filter our water and we're not pulling out the vegetables and cooking them up in the water mm-hmm. and eating this micro amounts that we need. That would be one thing. The other piece here, uh, at least in the United States, that we'll see regularly is a vitamin D deficiency. Yes. I do, mm-hmm. but I actually measure it, right? So I, I say test, do not guess. Let's measure that. That's, you know, the blood tests are very accurate. We'll get you to a certain amount. You don't need to be high, high amounts. These is fat-soluble vitamins, again, that can cause some issues. For example, some people take vitamin A and vitamin E oral supplementation. When you actually look at the science, those can be detrimental to your health. And so vitamin D, B12, and then the last one that I would say um, that I do recommend for, for certain individuals is an algae omega um, because omega-3s are very amazing. They're anti-inflammatory, mm-hmm. good for heart health, brain health, but you don't have to go to the fish. Go to the original source. The fish get their algae or their omegas from the algae. So again, you can avoid that, you know, the toxicity of potentially of mercury found in your in your fish and different things. So those would be the supplementations. Now, there's a few others that might be beneficial to different people, like berberine. If I have someone or amla, which is a Indian gooseberry, it's just a dried fruit. 
Um, you might see some improvement in cholesterol and some different things. Again, those are limited. The body is an amazing thing. We are humans. And so I don't think we need to say, like, oh, we need to write scripts or provide supplements that um, to make the body fix the body. It's like, again, I think you now we're just, we're almost doing, we're trying to be like the healthcare system, right? So if you're taking stuff that you don't need sure. to the system, that if you just get out of the way, give the proper inputs of the exercise and sleep and the appropriate healthy diet, your body will do what it does well. And then once you get those lifestyle habits in place, okay, now do we need some medications? Do we need to do a little supplementation? That's the healthy and, uh, and sustainable way to approach this without the potential rigors or the or the potential um, side effects and detrimental effects of too much supplementation um, or too much medications. Because um, I've seen patients who came and they were elevated high blood pressure. They were taking testosterone as a female and having tachycardia or high um, resting heart rate and high blood pressure. And I was like, what's going on? So I looked at it. We stopped that and suddenly things got better. But she was, you know, won over by the marketing, like, oh, testosterone to help with your libido. If you're a female, it's like, well, you're also overweight. You're not eating well. You're not sleeping well. No wonder your libido is low. Right. So let's talk about that, right? So it's just, again, people are looking for a fast fix. And mm -hmm. maybe, maybe it's a supplementation because they're like, I'm going the holistic way. Um, but you're doing the same thing. I'm sure it's not a prescription, but a supplement can be the same thing. And they can be dangerous. So you have to be very careful and educated about what you're doing. You're absolutely right, Doc. And you mentioned something that is key in all of this supplementation, hormone replacement therapy, whatever you're going to do to put in your body, monitoring. I mean, we are checking our blood like rigorously by our doctor every four months, period. So whatever we're taking is tailored to our needs. Not always is the same. It can be. You, 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 they look at that at microscope. They have to let us know what exactly we need and give us the compounded, you know, uh, hormone that we need or supplementation if we need it. But it's not like take it like, oh, I, it sounds good. Let me take it without knowing it really no, so monitoring is something that I is very key, and I'm glad you mentioned it. Yeah, I think, but I, I I want to just kind of float back to the blue zone idea. These individuals aren't taking hard doses of supplements. Nothing. They're not working out in a gym. They're just living a lifestyle that just promotes longevity, and they hit a hundred and and keep they on grow trucking. their own food. And so, at the end of the day, I don't. There's so much that we think right. that we're doing the holistic approach here in the United States. We're just building another massive money profit driven machine under I the know. guise of being holistic. So please be careful when you guys are seeing You're marketing. Right. Marketing is made to make you spend, open your check, write up, put your card in. So really at the end of the day, it's, it's, you have the choice and the simple choices will have the biggest effects. So don't forget that it's, you don't have to see a specialist or a doctor to do it. Just, just, <laughs> just do those you know, things that we talked about the, and you're going to see huge benefits. You mentioned, I mean, I grew up in Colombia. Yeah. I saw my aunts, my, my abuelas, my grandmas, they have uh -huh. huge patios and in the patio, it was uh -huh. all kind of foods, vegetables and chickens and whatever, uh -huh. guavas, mangoes, avocados. It was everything there. Uh -huh. I, I never saw them worry about, I oh, I, I have to take my vitamin there, what? No, they, they, normal, they have a very healthy life until they were very old. Right. But yeah, those are things you're right. Marketing 100%. plays a big role in this right. in this uh, era. We see advertisement right and left um, sure. for the medications, for the wellness as well. So, Doc, yeah. Dr. Marbus, you said vitamins are medicine. Yeah. But at the end of the day, food is medicine, right? Uh, food is oh, medicine. Is, food is medicine. Exercise is medicine. Sleep is medicine. Stress reduction. They're everything if you want to put it under that, that as an input into you is, can be considered your medicine. Mm -hmm. It's just making a decision which medicine. So well, Dr. You're... Marbas, we, we are working with the American Legion yeah. um, in support of Be The One program to help end veteran suicide. And well, a lot of our audience are veterans. You work with the military forces before you know it at first hand that all of these protocols that you're uh, describing to us could be 
extremely helpful for those folks. Um, I just think we need to do more into into getting into uh, spreading the word on wellness and simple things that they can Education. do to make big change. Right. Education, right? One hundred percent, right? I know there are. I know people who work within the BA system that are promoting lifestyle medicine and creating programs. So it's certainly That's shifting. Awesome. Um, but I also understand the VA system is a very complicated and broken system and people aren't getting the care that they need. So again, it behooves someone to do their own. You are responsible for yourself. You're responsible for your inner thoughts, your inner state of health, everything. You at the end of the day, no one's coming to save you. You have to start educating yourself, right? And so listening to these type of things, if it sparks a curiosity and you feel pulled, go do some more research. Like what is working for you? But you have to make different decisions. Working with the American Legion corporate in Indianapolis, um, they have younger people in than, you know, veterans. And they are very aware of the situation with the older veterans like me, you know, or that they they need to provide education because just hanging out at the bar and drinking beer and you know just being a social club without understanding what impact that has on their lifestyle you know right so i i think i think the american legion is stepping up to this problem that's great and it's wonderful to hear yes yeah we would produce in our coffee be the one coffee to support for uh be the one program to help to end veteran suicide. 23 veterans are taking their lives every day, today, tomorrow. We need to do something to stop that, Better. bring awareness and action, you know, because, you know, you, you, you're you from the Air Force, you work with them. Right. A lot of pride. Yeah, you were deployed to, the, to the Middle East, but if you take my war, Vietnam, you yeah. take Korea, which was the war before Vietnam, you take Iraq and Afghanistan, 100 Hundred and one thousand deaths due to combat. A hundred and twenty-five thousand veterans have committed suicide since two thousand and one. So wow. more deaths due to veterans taking suicide. their own lives. Very preventable stuff than right. in the last three wars our country's been involved in. The last yeah, last three wars. So yeah. this is tragic, and it, yes. it's, it's we have to do something about it. That's that's why when they invited us to participate in this program i said without a doubt it's a mission without a doubt and we thank you very much for what you're doing as well because with your podcast with your program educating people in better choices Uh to take control of their lives this is what we're doing here trying to you know contribute to the solution in bringing education or at least questioning people in better ways that they can implement in their lives to get yep. control of their health and get healthier and happier. Thank you for all, thank you for so all you do you. and you know your your vast knowledge and uh, I think Claudia you're going to put in the uh, in the podcast a way people could reach out yes. to Dr. Marbus, right? Thank yes, you. I got to put all of the information in the description box, the website, and all um, of the contact information if, if our audience want to get in touch with you and benefit from your knowledge and your experience. So we thank you very much for participating with us today in this discussion and and your perspective and your experience was today at full display. We appreciate that very much, Dr. Marvas. Well, thank you for having me. It was a delight and honor to be here. So continue the good work. It's fantastic. So thank, thank you, you. Well, so much. As a sergeant in the Air Force, I guess I need to salute you. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, yes. Oh, no. And thank I, you I, for I, your <laughs> service. Thank you for your service, too, Bruce. Thank that you. was okay. lovely. Thank you. So. To our audience out there, remember, health is wealth for the body, mind, and soul. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next time. Thank you very much for listening. And if you like the information that we shared with you today, please subscribe to the Express Soul Health and Wellness podcast and follow us in the social media outlets of your choice. Until next time, please remember, health is wealth for the body, mind and soul.